Your Notre Dame live stream will begin soon. Thanks for watching. Good afternoon. I'm not going to take up much of your time because I know you're here to hear the people on the stage. So just on behalf of the Kellogg Institute for International Studies and Paolo Carrazza, our director, who could not be here today, thank you for coming. We are super excited about this event and very, very grateful to our faculty fellows, Samuel Valenzuela and Father Tim Scully, for organizing it. I'm going to turn it over to Tim to do introductions since he knows these guys much better than I do. Thanks again. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, it's so much fun. It's just a delight to welcome home uh, a number of friends. Uh, so, and it really is true. Uh, there's just a, a deep, deep friendship that uh, bonds the, the three of them, but also really the five of us. Uh, we've known each other for a long time. I'll start, um, I'll start, if I may, and I'll be as brief as possible. Because when you've known these people as long as I have, it, you could go on forever. So I'll, be, I'll try to be very disciplined. I'll start with the person I've known the longest, Ignacio Walker. Um, now, all three of these folks are graduates, quasi-graduates, of uh, St. George's College in Santiago, Chile. I'll explain the quasi uh, when I introduce uh, Andres. Um, but, you know, St. George's College during the 1960s and 70s was a place of extraordinary effervescence in, in a lot of ways. And uh, one of the things we're very proud of is that um, this is a school sponsored by the Congregation of Holy Cross, to which I belong. And, um, and, 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 and there's a culture, uh, certainly it was heightened in those days, of, of kind of get inv invent, uh, inviting people to really get engaged uh, with social and political and cultural realities in a deep way. Um, and so these three are, are, we're very, very proud of these graduates of our school. Um, I think they would all say in one way or another that their, um, that their interest in public service and politics and the public arena uh, was ignited there. Um, so, so I met Ignacio, uh, I, I, there's, a, there's a priest that kind of joins all of us in one way or another. His name is Father Jerry Whalen. Um, and if you had a chance to see the movie Machuca, uh, you would know that he, he's the main character in this, in this uh, film. Um, but Ignacio uh, and I were introduced by, uh, by Jerry Whalen in 1979. I was working at CIDE as, a, um, as an economist, and, um, and uh, we had lunch, and, and he decided that I was the most gringo human being he ever met, because I, <laughs> I, and I am, because I ordered ham and cheese sandwich. And I'll never forget his. Anyway, Ignacio and Cecilia uh, sang at my, uh, my final vows uh, in uh, Nuestra Señora de, de Andacoyo in Mapocho and then uh, at my, um, at my uh, ordination. He was a, a lawyer at the Vicaria de Solidaridad in, in Santiago, uh, where he brags about the fact that for seven years he never won a case. Uh, <laughs> And uh, that'll tell you, uh, he suggests it's because of the quality of the judiciary. I suggest that it's because of the quality of his advocacy. But uh, uh, he, he then went on to get a PhD at Princeton. He's a great political theorist. Uh, he served in the Elwin government. Uh, prior to that, he, he served as the executive secretary, if you will, of the No campaign. There's a lot to say. In fact, he invited me to be in the No headquarters that night uh, when uh, the uh, election took place. He served as a representative uh, in the House, uh, a senator, secretary of state. Um, he's currently at the Kellogg Institute as a Hewlett Fellow for Public uh, Policy. Um, Andres Alaman, I got to know in the Woodrow Wilson Center for International uh, uh, Scholars in 1985. Um, we were there together with Ricardo Lagos and uh, Sergio Vitar. And uh, I'm really proud of this fact that it's my very first publication was, uh, was about what uh, 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 Ricardo uh, and Andres and Sergio said at that conference. Um, he left St. George's uh, at age 16 to, to, to join a, a liceo, a public school, uh, because he was called the, the vocation of politics at that age. In a way, all three of them were. Uh, but he couldn't run for the student body presidency of all Chile's public schools if he, didn't, uh, if he wasn't enrolled in a public school. So this was, this was something you just didn't do. That's like crossing a kind of a social cultural Rubicon, uh, which he did. And he's been doing that ever since. Um, a person of extraordinary principle and integrity, uh, a person who knows who he is and, uh, and makes no apologies for his uh, perspective. He's also the founder of a very, very important uh, party uh, in Chile, Renovación Nacional, 
um, which is a party that, that, that brings a long tradition of, of social Christianity uh, into the public arena from the perspective of a little bit more um, smaller state and, uh, and kind of market-driven uh, ideology, I'd say, something like that. Eugenio. Uh, I got to know Eugenio through his brother Ernesto in Cachawa uh, at the beach, and uh, we've been friends ever since. Uh, he also graduated from St. George's. He's probably Chile's, I'm going to say something oh, very opinionated, he's probably Chile's most interesting public intellectual. Uh, he, he writes quite a bit uh, and speaks quite a bit in public media. Um, he was the designer of what you're about to see, uh, the No Campaign. Uh, he's really a genius publicist. I use him as kind of my rabbi in uh, Chile. He's really a deep counselor to the Congregation of Holy Cross. And uh, he, he currently leads uh, one of Chile's leading marketing firms. So on behalf of all of us, a, a thousand welcomes to all of you. I think all of you know my colleague, uh, Samuel Valenzuela, who will probably introduce himself briefly in a minute, but he's an extraordinarily uh, pr uh, 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 prom uh, uh, prom uh, prominent, thank you, prominent uh, so sociologist who uh, has taught me more about Chilean politics than anybody in my life, so great. We're going to go and sit in the front and watch this little clip, and we'll get right back to you. Very exciting. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Voy a decir que no Porque nace el arco iris Después de la tempestad Porque quiero que florezcan Mil maneras de pensar Porque sin la dictadura La alegría va a llegar Porque pienso en el futuro Voy a decir que no Vamos a decir que no oh. Con la fuerza de mi voz Vamos a decir que no Soy madre de Manuel Jesús Cristo, detenida y desaparecida el 27 Soy hermana de Ruperto Torres Aravena, detenido y desaparecido desde el 13 de octubre de 1973. Usted depende que nunca más vuelva a ocurrir. No más desaparecido. Ya, aquí está su pancito. ¿Algo más? Anota esto, don Aníbal. Voy a llevarte también. ¿Cómo no? ¿Dos bolsitas? Una nomás. Todos tenemos una razón para votar no. No más miseria. The pain of Chile over these long years has been the pain of all of us. Los personeros del gobierno dicen que Chile se ha convertido en un país moderno. Eso a lo mejor es cierto para ellos que viven en una burbuja que está más en contacto con los mercados internacionales que con el país real. Porque lo que es para para la mayoría de los chilenos esa modernización no es más que una propaganda de la televisión. Chile puede ser un país moderno y desarrollado. Basta para eso que nos sacudamos del arcaísmo, que nos sacudamos del miedo, que nos sacudamos del autoritarismo. En Chile, la modernización tiene un nombre, democracia. Señor, 
¿Qué le diría usted a un dictador? ¡No! ¡No! Y este hombre que dijo se retiraría, quiere permanecer hasta 1997. Durante estos 15 años, el país y usted superaron barreras muy difíciles para salir adelante, con sacrificio, con esfuerzo, Hoy cuando estamos a un paso de salvar la última valla, hay algunos que no quieren que Chile siga siendo un país ganador. Quieren que volvamos atrás, que usted vuelva a pagar el costo. Sea responsable de que su voto sea responsable. Si piensa, piensa sí. Si algo caracteriza al régimen militar que termina es que este ha sentado las bases para el crecimiento económico. Chile ha iniciado un gran cambio en este campo y este cambio se puede resumir en una frase. No es el Estado, ni mucho menos las burocracias gobernantes de turno, las que crean el progreso. El desarrollo lo crea usted, pero el desarrollo sin democracia es siempre una experiencia social incompleta, porque solo la democracia proporciona la necesaria estabilidad a las políticas económicas en aplicación, porque solo la democracia entrega los mecanismos de fiscalización indispensables al poder ejecutivo, y porque solo la democracia entrega los canales legítimos de participación. la esperanza memories uh, and uh, so as we move forward um, my colleague and friend uh, Samuel Valenzuela is going to set the context and then we're going to hear from our three panelists and then we'll have a conversation and open it up to the uh, broader to the broader uh, folks here well we just saw Senator Alemán and Eugenio Tironi speaking in these two videos of one on the side of the no one on the side of the yes, and they both said the same thing. They said, modernity requires democracy. The new economy, the new change, the new Chile requires democracy. So this has been seen as a contest between a continuation of Pinochet or as the end of Pinochet. But no, for many of its, the participants on the yes side, this was seen as a change towards democracy, but led still by a constitutionally chosen through the plebiscite, Pinochet, for another eight years, according to the constitution that he had written. So this led to a negotiation between both sides over the content of that constitution. And the reason why this happened was because Pinochet himself and his followers began to read the Constitution in a very different light because everything that seemed to be so appropriate when it came to Pinochet continuing as president suddenly turned out in, to be a big hurdle. 
like the eight-year term that he was proposing Pinochet for himself. So he himself suggested to Elwin through a conduit that maybe you could govern only for four years, right? And Elwin said, yeah. And this opened the box for a negotiation between both sides in order to change the constitution mm -hmm. through a plebiscite, a new plebiscite. Now, a new plebiscite was needed in order to change the constitution at that point. And if Pinochet had simply said, okay, we're gonna just uh, change this uh, constitution the way I want it to be changed, the result would have been another victory for the forces opposed to Pinochet. And so this was a box that they had set themselves into. And the only way out of that box was to negotiate changes to the constitution that the opposition uh, thought necessary so that the constitution would be at least minimally democratic in their view. Now that was the first phase. The second phase then of changes to the constitution began after the Elwin government started. And these were very profound. So the question then becomes, the route that was taken was the one that led to the kind of democracy that Chile has today and to its great economic success. Now, would the other route have led to the same result if the yes had won? And so we enter into this counterfactual discussion, but counterfactual discussion based on the fact that we know exactly what the institutions would have looked like under Pinochet. So with a yes vote, right? So for instance, would the parties of the left have been able to present their candidates for office? No, but this was changed in such a way that they were able to do so. For instance, would the National Security Council have continued to have the same powers that it had? National Security Council, people appointed by the regime, essentially. And of course, no, but the National Security Council was altered in that negotiation. Would the Constitution itself have been changed in terms of the way its uh, articles were modified? Well. No, because that was also changed in the period before Elwin assumed office. And would the Senate have been expanded so that the uh, designated senators who remained in place after this negotiation at least had a smaller proportion of the Senate? And of course, no. These were the changes that were done in the first phase in which the primary participant for the right was Andres Aleman, at age 32, by the way. The democratic government then began with Elwin and further changes were made, all of them culminating finally in the 2005 document that completely democratized the Chilean constitution. This put the military in their place, eliminated the influence of military justice, it restored democratic government to the municipalities. It tackled the, trans the transitional justice issues, putting Pinochet's secret police chief in jail in 95 for life. And it reformed completely the judicial system, minimizing the influence of military justice. So the question is, would all of these things have occurred if the yes had won, right? And would this tremendous success of Chile, which is now an OECD high income country, the fastest growing economy since 1990 to 2015, would all of that happen? And so we invite your participation with reminiscences of the no campaign, yes campaign of that time, and with a discussion of these counterfactual propositions. Thank you. Great, yeah. thank you. I <laughs> Bueno, thank you very much, uh, Father Scali and Samuel, for the, this kind uh, presentation <coughs> words. I'm very glad to be here um, with uh, Ignacio and Eugenio. We're all very good friends, and I think we can push forward a good conversation, an open conversation, about what happened in Chile after 30 years. 30 years is a lot of time. When I was just watching Eugenio myself over there on the screen, <laughs> 30 years are 30 years. Bueno, anyway, 
to just to 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 understand in a in a proper way what was the role of the democratic right, uh, it's needed to to move a little bit backwards and try to make two or three points. First, uh, the democratic center right uh, dissolved itself after the coup. This is a very strange thing. Even before the Pinochet regime, the dictatorship banned the political parties, the parties of the, of the right, basically group in the Partido Nacional, decided to dissolve itself, uh, uh, digamos, itself and simply disappear from the political arena. The, this was, a, from my point of view, uh, I was by then only a kid of 16 years, but from my point of view was a very, a very a big historical mistake. Uh, because basically what happened is that the right as, a, as, a, as an organized force was not able to, rise, to raise its voice uh, during the military di dictatorship in terms of the violations and the abuses of human rights and also because the democratic right didn't have a role in the constitution 1980 definitions and more than that in the definition of how was uh, the way to transit to democracy. This idea of the plebiscite was the idea of only the hardliners of the, of the regime. So uh, the regrouping of the, of the center right, democratic center right, started 10 years after the coup in 1883. Two years, two years uh, after, in 1885, the democratic center right, and this is very important, uh, signed the, what's, what's so called the Acuerdo para la Democracia Plena. plena. This was a document sponsored by the Catholic Church, that for the first time after 10, after 12 years of dictatorship, bring together all the democratic political parties, the ones that were in the opposition to the military government and the ones as the party I founded and lead, uh, Union Nacional and then Renovación Nacional, by now the largest party in the country, that we so call ourselves as independent in terms of the government. That national accord basically uh, I mean, seek two purposes. First, to obtain the replacement of the plebiscite. Nobody that signed the Acuerdo Nacional agree with this very strange uh, formula for a transition. Why, instead of having a free and open and contested election, why having this plebiscite in which President Pinochet or General Pinochet would be presented to the people to a yes or no vote? As you know, the yes vote, will, 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 I mean, the, the meaning of the, of the yes vote was that Pinochet would start another period uh, for eight years, and the no vote means that after one year, a free and open <coughs> election with several candidates would be contested, and also with a parliamentary election. So we, the democratic right, were strongly against this plebiscite. We thought it was a very bad way of transiting to democracy. But nevertheless, finally, the military regime decided to reject the Acuerdo Nacional, and finally, the candidacy of Pinochet was immediately imposed. At that time, and I guess Eugenio can, we can share with Eugenio what were the polls, because this is something important. When the race was open, all the polls gave something like this. For the yes vote, between 40 or 45 percent of support. For the no vote, something almost even, 40, 45, a little bit more. So this was not exactly a neck-to-neck -neck race, but of course was a very contested election between two forces that mainly mean almost half of each represent the country. What we did in the, in the democratic <laughs> right after, after the, the plebiscite, I, for instance, I had absolutely the convincement that Pinochet would be defeated. But the point was, and Samuel was speaking about this, the point was, what would happen after the no vote? What would be the, what would be the, the, the political process open? And the important thing that must be said is that the no vote <coughs> opened a very interesting and political process. The bargaining between the rules of the, fall of the, of the upcoming transition. The 1980 constitution, must be, was, was an absolutely must to be reformed. Because the way it was written initially included a, f a complete, I mean, a number of institutions that make almost impossible a real transition to democracy, and more than that, a real democracy after that. 
For instance, there was a, Samuel mentioned this, there was a so-called Consejo de Seguridad Nacional, National Security Council. That National Security Council was integrated by the four members of the armed forces and the president of the republic that was in a minority position. So the body National Security Council was entitled to represent, that means to give his opinion, to any decision made, for instance, by the president of the republic, by the senate, by the chamber of deputies. Es decir, a, a, a democracy and, under, under a guardianship of the military, absolutely. So um, the main effort, and this is some of the key things of the Chilean transition, was made by all the political forces. And finally, we were able to agree in, 50, in 54 reforms to the constitution. These 54 reforms for the constitution, I would say, was the key for having this peaceful transition we finally got. Because what, what, the, what was the, the, the bottom line of, the, of this uh, amendment of the Constitution? <clears throat> that finally the Chileans have decided, whatever were the positions before the yes or the no vote, that the path for democracy would be a path of reform and not a path of revolution. And into that path of reform, the, I mean, the key point was that the rules of the games established by the dictatorship must be removed due, using the same mechanisms of the, of the, of the, of the, of the Constitution. So, uh, just to end, the, the main effect of the, of the no vote was to open a, process, a political process, a bargaining process, and finally lead with this amendment of the Constitution to a transition that's been peaceful and very successful. <coughs> Ignacio or Eugenio? Okay. Como quiera. Great. Yeah, I, 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 I tried to figure what will happen with uh, after Tim and Sammy wrote me if they just had won. Huh? Uh, I, and I would say that the first thing it was uh, that the, uh, the result will be questioned by the opposition and, and, and probably by the uh, foreign opinion and foreign governments. Uh, the forces of the no <coughs> uh, have called to a mobilization to denounce the foul, uh, forcing the regime to repress uh, these people in the streets, and so uh, ruining the efforts of Pinochet to uh, build an, an image of a normal democratic president. In this polarized context, I will say that probably the leaders of the no <coughs> will be replaced by a more intransigent and more hard leadership uh, of the, probably from the left of the Pinochet's opposition. The Communist Party, who was against, at the beginning, against the no, against the negotiation with the, the regime, and, and, uh, and reluctant to the plebiscite will, will be looked as justified. Huh? Uh, the, the argument was uh, to renounce to any hope of a, a peaceful transition and to use the force, including armed groups, to create a, a, a revolution situation so to, to finish with Pinochet and with the economic system he built up. In, they were thinking in Nicaragua, or in the Sandinist, Sandinistas in Nicaragua. So uh, in that moment, the unity built around the no was, uh, <coughs> will be uh, dynamitized. Uh, and probably the Socialist Party will be uh, uh, separate from the Christian Democrats and uh, began uh, uh, allies of the Communist Party in the, in the so-called left unity. Uh, probably, uh, the, well, uh, the, uh, uh, you, I, I made the question, what will happen? The communist, the, the position led by the communists, could succeed, succeed 
in, in, those, in that context? I don't think so. I think that the Pinochet, uh, after the votes he got in the plebiscite, with uh, the economic situation that was going much better than in the, in the middle uh, or the beginning of the 80s, with a clear route uh, through the plebiscite, I think he will be, and, and with the fear of disorder and violence, he will be much more strong to continue uh, uh, governing. Huh? So, if they just uh, 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 had one, I think we, we will have a completely different Chile as uh, the Chile we have today. We, we, we <coughs> probably a whole decade and perhaps more extended period would have been consumed in an increasingly violent conflict between two poles. Right? One pole supported the maintenance of uh, the dictatorship <coughs> institution and the capitalism, uh, the US type of capitalism that Pinochet built. Uh, another, on the other pole, uh, supportive uh, uh, demolishing and returning to the situation of 1973. Uh, and, and probably uh, seduced by the Chavismo that at the end of the 90s was beginning to uh, arise in Latin America. Uh, that, that's a completely different situation, uh, probably with a an, an, uh, very uh, important cost in human lives, and it costs also in economic stability, uh, uh, investors, and growth, and, and, and poverty reduction. Uh, um, and, and, I, and I would say that in 1997, in the elections of 1997, the two main uh, competitors uh, had been the, not the concertation, not the alliance between the Christian Democrats and the Socialists, but probably some kind of alliance of Renovación Nacional of Andrés Alamán and the Christian Democrats of Ignacio Walker and probably myself in one poll mm. and in the other poll the left, the hard left, the I would say more the the Chavistas or the Chavista hard left. Uh, so the the scenario would be a, a typical Latin American scenario. Uh, and I think that that, uh, that didn't happen. <coughs> and and the, the concertación was created. The concertación is a very magic uh, uh, artifact because it's the creation of, uh, of two forces, the Christian Democrats and the Socialists, who were fighting around Allende, and now they create a coalition that governed Chile for 2020 or 20. In fact, the politics that uh, this coalition uh, developed had been, uh, uh, there is a continuity between these politics from 1990 to today. So uh, the, the, there was a great difference in, uh, with the no winning the, the plebiscite. Wonderful. Eugenio, thanks so much. Ignacio. Well, First of all, thank you for this invitation, for allowing us to have this conversation uh, on the occasion of this anniversary, you know, the 30th anniversary of the Yes, No uh, plebiscite uh, in 1998, which is, of course, a matter of, of celebration. Uh, and I think that's the mood in the country. I want to begin by a statement, uh, uh, especially having listened to the introduction uh, of Samuel, to which I shall refer. We have to understand that the Pinochet dictatorship was defeated. No, was defeated by social, political, and electoral mobilization. No, that started in the struggle for human rights with the big protagonism of the Catholic Church in the late 70s, no, and ended up with this uh, yes, no plebiscite in 1988. So there was 17 years of a struggle, or 15 years until 88, no, of the forces, social and political forces of opposition, no, struggling against the dictatorship in favor of human rights, no, uh, trying to recover democracy. I say this because in the introduction of Samuel, there are two aspects that I want to touch. First, of course, there was the backdrop of modernization. No? 
in which we may share in common very uh, lots of similar views in terms of continuity and change, because who would uh, be against uh, the opening of the economy? economy, for example, or a certain role for the market, and so on and so forth. So that's the backdrop of modernization, which in fact is behind all this political process. Uh, and second, when Samuel was referring, I just want to make this clear, to negotiations, that was the plebiscite that came after in 1989, the following year, no? in which we came together, uh, together we agreed on a set of 54 uh, reforms to the constitution no? uh, uh, by 80% of the, of the people, so it was the no and the yes vote that came together to support those you know, uh, democratization reforms in order to have a certain minimum standard, which demonstrated something very important, that the constitution was not untouchable. No, that you could mm -hmm. introduce by building certain agreements, certain consensus, a change in the constitution. So my first statement is that we don't have to lose of sight that the Pinochet dictatorship was defeated politically and electoral, through the social, political, and electoral mobilization of the Chilean people from the very outset. Second point, look, the common doctrine, the shared doctrine, in all the opposition, no, in the 70s and the 80s, especially after 1980, when the constitution was uh, passed in a, in a plebiscite, uh, we called it illegitimate in its origins and anti-democratic in its content. That was the doctrine that came from the Grupo de los 24, the group of constitutional studies of the opposition. There were no two opinions in the opposition uh, in the 70s, and especially in the 80s. So why was it that we decided to go into the plebiscite that was contemplated in this constitution, that was illegitimate in its origins, no, and anti-democratic uh, in its uh, content. So why would we decide to go ahead in the registration of the padrones electorales, the re registration process led by the dictatorship under the umbrella of the constitution? No? Uh, considering that this was uh, uh, illegitimate. No? And that this meant somehow recognizing some formal, some sort of legitimacy of the constitution. If you go into the plebiscite and that's part of the constitution, you play by the rules of the game of the Constitution, no? a set of rules of the game. And second, we had been cheated twice in the consulta of 78, the consultation process, and the plebiscite of 1980 in which the Constitution was passed, Pinochet won. So many people legitimately in the opposition said, well, sh why should we go for the third time and get defeated in the same kind of logic? No? So uh, the point is that we thought of it in terms of the plebiscite, you know, uh, as a certain occasion in order to advance the cause of democracy by using the tools and the devices and the plebiscite that it was established to re-elect Pinochet <clears throat> for eight more years. But we thought we could turn it over and against Pinochet. In fact, there was a draft document by Eugenio Tironi of October 87. He said, look, our enemy is not really Pinochet. Our enemy is fear. And this plebiscite provides the occasion and the scenario to get together, all of us, against Pinochet. So in fact, we said the best scenario, this was 88, for the opposition was a plebiscite with Pinochet as a candidate. Because that would bring all of us together in the opposition with no candidate, no program, no coalition, no candidates for parliament just saying no to Pinochet. So there was a boomerang effect. No? That this plebiscite of 88 that was drafted in the 1980 constitution to re-elect Pinochet for eight more years turned against Pinochet because we used this mechanism as a kind of formal concession. Yes, we're going into the plebiscite. Yes, we're going to register. No, But in order to defeat the yes no vote, the Pinochet, the 1980 constitution, by appealing to the tradition, the Republican democratic tradition, that we always thought it was in the minds of the people. No? So the no vote in which he said, without fear, without violence, without hatred, vote no, no, with a pencil. So we were using the rules of the game of the Pinochet dictatorship. Nobody could blame us of being terrorists, extremists, you know, so we took 
uh, opportunity and advantage of that, uh, of recognizing the Constitution as a fact. There was a statement by Patricio Elwin in 1984, famous statement, mm -hmm. in which he said, look, let us put aside the discussion about the legitimacy of the Constitution, because that will lead us nowhere. We will never build a common ground if we continue talking about the legitimacy of the Constitution, because for us, the Constitution was illegitimate in its content, and uh, illegitimate in its origins, and anti-democratic in its content. So Elwin said, let us consider the Constitution as a fact, como un hecho. Uh, let us agree that it is a fact. It is there. No? Each one of us may have its own opinions about the legitimacy of the Constitution. And that you know, created a kind of more pro pragmatic you know, approach in terms of political realism. You know? uh, 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 so I finish with the following. Because at the beginning of 1988, imagine our mindset, the discussion in our parties, there were 17 parties in the opposition, you know, <coughs> about whether to go again, so be cheated for the third time, in the registering, you know, well, so it was very scary. I mean, we had all kinds of doubts, you know, but in the end, it was stronger, this idea of the opportunity that it provided in order to overcome fear that the best scenario for us in the position was all against Pinochet. And that was the no vote, for whatever reasons. <laughs> no? And we all came together against Pinochet. And I finish with this, because by the late 87, there were three stra strategies in Chile. One, the 1990 constitution, the yes vote, Pinochet, around democracia protegida, protected democracy, no? protected from the people, basically. Well, <laughs> but with its authoritarian enclaves and the locks, everything that we know, designated Senate, you know. That was stra one strategy. The 1980 Constitution, the yes vote, Pinochet, let us re-elect him until 1997, so he would reach 25 years in power. You know? The second option, at the opposite side, as Eugenio said, was the Communist Party. The Communist Party decided, after the 1980 Constitution and the Nicaraguan Revolution of 1979, that we, could, we should change the strategy against the dictatorship. The Communist Party had advocated an anti-fascist front between Christian Democrats and the Communist Party and the Socialists, which didn't work. So the Communist Party shifted its position in terms of the via insurreccional, no? considering the uh, military and paramilitary devices, the increasing use of revolutionary violence. This is in the January in 1985 Central Committee of the Communist Party that decided that they would include a military element you know, in the strategy. You know? And there was a third strategy, which is our strategy, most of the, of the parties of, of the opposition, which was peaceful transition to democracy. You know? Through social, political, and electoral mobilization. Starting with the struggles of human rights and ending up in this incredible campaign of the no vote, which was the culmination. I stopped there, because many people said, you know, with a pencil we defeated the, the military dictators. It was much more than a pencil. It took 15 years of social, political, and electoral mobilization against the political dictatorship. And yes, we are skillful enough to use this pencil to, to appeal to the memories, civic, republican, democratic memories of the Chilean people. So this was a culmination of the strategy, successful strategy, of a peaceful transition to democracy thus defeating both the yes vote continuity strategy of the 1980 constitution, which was defeated, and also, also defeating the kind of militaristic insurrectional views of the Communist Party, which had not worked. You know, they tried in 1986, El Año de Sisivo, there was an assassination attempt to Pinochet, they brought in the arms cachets. So, you know, this was the victory of one of the three strategies. No? That was not continuity, not insurrectional, but the peaceful transition to democracy through social, political, and electoral mobilization, culminating in the victory of the no vote. Let me add a, a footnote to what uh, Ignacio said, <clears throat> and that is about the electoral system. Uh, the Constitutional Court, which, unlike the other aspects of the 1980 Constitution, was functioning during the 80s, decided against Pinochet's wishes that the coming plebiscite would be held under all the rules 
of how you do elections, electoral procedures, that corresponded to the incoming democratic phase. Now, that, those rules were basically a copy, a verbatim copy of the electoral rules that Chile had always before. had before. And so there's an, there's, a, there's an image here of a democracy that had been destroyed, lost, but a democracy whose institutions were still in people's minds. And the Constitutional Court, even though it was appointed by Pinochet, went back to those images of how you do democracy, and that was fundamental for the result. John Updike has this great line, and I was reminded of it when I was looking at the uh, plebiscite uh, footage there. Um, he, said, <clears throat> he said, there's no memento mori more compelling than a faded photograph. So there's been 30 years that has kind of passed since uh, that nerdy picture of Eugenio Tironi there, the little brainy guy <laughs> there with the big glasses. And I'm just, uh, I'm just, I wonder, this requires a little bit of vulnerability, uh, but you know, we're all on a journey, we're all learning. If you knew then what you know now, what would you have done differently? What would you have thought differently? Then meaning 1988? Yes, yes. If you knew then, in 1988, what you know now, 30 years later, what would you have thought differently? What would you have done differently? Um, again, it requires a little bit of humility on all of our part. God, I've got a whole, you know, list, but anybody want to share? <laughs> yeah, it's difficult to, I mean, the most obvious uh, answer for, for someone like me is to say, after the, what we know now, 30 years afterwards, uh, why you didn't vote no? <laughs> that is uh, basically the, the basic response. Uh, the thing is not so simple. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It's not so simple because what we really knew, and I was absolutely convinced that the, remember one point, the outcome of the plebiscite, and the plebiscite was a fair one, in terms of the outcome, mm -hmm. was 55, 45% of the vote. That's, that is, I mean, it's not a, it's not a draw, <laughs> but, it's a, but, but it's a lot of fundamental forces in the 45% of the vote. That's right. For instance, all these modifications of the constitutions, how you can do it without counting the 45% of the vote? Right. The 45% 45, 45 of the vote are needed. Sometimes in the transition processes, they are needed political forces that play some sort of, uh, how do you say, bisagra, hinge? Yeah. Hinge. Mm -hmm. the, the, yeah, be, being able Fulcrum. to put together people from one side and people from the other side. So uh, I knew Pinochet was being defeated. I don't have any, I never, I never was a member of the military regime, no doubt about that. Uh, I don't have any kind of sympathy of Pinochet at all. Um, but I really think that uh, was a role for the democratic right in the sense of playing some sort of an important <coughs> role in terms of this bargaining. The bargaining between only the democratic opposition and the military government have concluded in absolutely nothing. So the key point, one of the key points of that bargaining was exactly uh, what we did in terms of bringing together the <coughs> positions. The, the positions were very strong. For instance, the hardliners of the sea vote said, okay, Pinochet was defeated in the plebiscite, but there's no need for, change, for any change of constitution. Hmm. And more than that, they say, look, these guys won the plebiscite, so they recognize the constitution, hmm. so now what they must do is follow the norms of the constitution. And the norms <laughs> of the constitution, in a lot of parts, were completely anti-democratic. Mm -hmm. But they had a very strong position. The armed forces backing them, and 45% of the vote in mm -hmm. the same sense. Right. So, uh, so I really think that uh, this, uh, this, uh, I mean, commitment towards uh, negotiating and towards looking for a, for a good solution was something good. Uh, the other thing I want to say, so what I'm saying is I would be, I, I shouldn't have made, my, my behavior would, wouldn't have been very, very different. Very different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the, the second thing is important, uh, Tim, is the following. What was also important uh, is that the no vote, I mean, the no vote was a great day for Chilean democracy. 
open a process. And open a process <coughs> not only in terms of the constitutional reforms, but open a process of a rebirth of the values of the traditional values of the, of, the, of the Chilean democracy. The Chilean democracy before the 60s was a democracy which backbone was compromise, agreement, bargainings, uh, <coughs> civic friendship was very important. Uh, I think that maybe we should have started before the efforts in terms of rebuilding the civic friendship, friendship in, in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, all that started uh, basically after the, the plebiscite. Maybe we would have started before, mm -hmm. and that would be, have been better for the country. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks Andres. Well, uh, uh, I would say I'm trying to help a little bit my friend Andres. I think that, that uh, his plea for the yes, plea yes, was the cost he paid to, to play afterwards a key role in, uh, the, democrat in the negotiations to change the constitution. <coughs> Uh, without that, sure. he couldn't play the role he played uh, towards the regime, towards Pinochet, hmm. uh, facilitating that's the interesting. Um, mm -hmm. That's politics. Mm -hmm. that's, that's politics. That's, that's not political science. That's politics. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I beg your pardon. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and, and I saw myself here. Uh, I remember the reason why I was asked to appear uh, uh, with Sol Serrano, Patricio Mere, Javier Martinez, and myself. We were in charge to, to write, this. We, we were the speech writers of the politicians who appeared in the Franca, uh, in the TV propaganda. Uh, and we tried to frame them in the, in the in what we were thinking, that, that means uh, economic and social continuity, and, uh, and the only change is in the political arena, and to have uh, free elections, nothing else, because we were afraid of fear, <laughs> uh, of producing mm. fear. Mm. But that, we tried that, and that we didn't succeed always. So they asked me, to, uh, to make public the brief. <laughs> and the brief was that uh, we, the modernization is not with Pinochet, the Chilean modernization, that meant economic transformations. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not with Pinochet, it's with us. We are more competitive in that field than Pinochet. Mm. Uh, because we are democracy, and without democracy you can't have real modernization. That was, so, probably nobody understood my speech. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I would do, do something different, I, I think that we were too, 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 very hard, very, uh, with the communists, with the, with the, with the people of the second strategy, you said, Ignacio. Uh -huh. We didn't, uh, no facto misericordia, <coughs> uh, yeah. uh, to understand what lacking, happened with them. Lacking compassion. We didn't reach compassion. out. Compassion. Lacking compassion. Uh, they, they fought for their ideas. They paid a, a <coughs> human uh, a sacrifice, and a, a lot of people killed uh, for, a, for an illusion, for an idea. And, and, Topic idea. They they had moral problems, much more problems to to enter in a negotiation with the with the regime, uh, and and we didn't understood that, and we were very 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 uh, uh, I would tough. say tough. 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 Yeah. yeah. I think that um, that I would be uh, that I would be different nowadays. Thank you. Ignacio, you yeah, I would just like to add, sharing this idea that democratization and modernization have been at the core of all this political and economic process in the last 30 years. No? In fact, now there's a new book by Alejandro Foxley, a good friend of this university and the Kellogg, uh, who talks about the second transition. So the first transition was to democracy. 
and the second tra transition is ought to be toward development. No? And this, uh, I want to be, you know, we are all being very honest as much as we can here, but, and I don't want to be complacent, but really, looking in retrospect, looking in retrospect, 30 years after the plebiscite, no? uh, I never thought, I never thought we would have gone so far in terms of what, what we have achieved as a country. Not only the political forces of the no vote. No? And I always have in mind, I think we all have in <coughs> mind, there was an incredible book in the 20th century by Aníbal Pinto, late 1950s, which is called Chile, un caso de desarrollo frustrado. Chile, case of frustrated development, mm -hmm. failed development. Exactly, frustrated. Frustrated development. Mm -hmm. You know, that was like the portrait of the 20th century of Chile. No? We did manage to move ahead as we should in terms of reaching development. And today, when you look not only at the numbers, at the figures, I mean, average growth from 1990 to 2014 was 5% for 24 years, average growth, which meant that poverty reduction has come down from 40% to 8.6, according to the last no, statistics three, months, three weeks ago, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, and at the core of this process was the coming together of Christian democracy, my party, and democratic socialist movement. Partido Socialista, Socialist Party, Party for Democracy, Radical Party, and so on. I see the point of hearing about the Communist Party, but let me be very clear. Both the Socialist left and the Communist left suffered the same from the dictatorship in terms of casualties and repression. The same. Desaparecidos, political executions, torture. But they followed completely different paths. The Socialist Party followed the path of Renovación Socialista, very much under the influence of Mitterrand, Eurocommunism, Berlinguer, you know, those of you who studied, and some of them were, many of them, in exile in Europe. And, and the Communist Party went the opposite, having the same casualties, the same kind of repression. No, so each one has to take responsibility of one's own uh, <coughs> strategies. I end up with the following, because I said I didn't want, didn't want to be complacent. I think we failed, we, uh, in the concertación, which was 20 years, I mean, you can imagine. I considered to be paid with the victory of the no vote. In addition, we governed 20 years, four administrations of the concertación, the coming together of Christian democracy and democratic socialism, no? But my self-critical approach, among many others, of course, is that we should have demonstrated from the outset that what we were doing was more out of convictions rather than concessions. <laughs> you see what I mean? Because everything would appear that we had to make all these concessions because, you know, Pinochet and the 1980 Constitution and the authoritarian enclaves and the de designated senators. That's true. No? But at least, in my own view, what we have achieved <coughs> as a country no, is very much out of convictions rather than concessions. And I finish with this because Today, I was talking with some Spanish friends here in, in Kellogg. You have this, excuse me, huh? crazy revisionism. I call it crazy. In Spain and in Chile. Considering that the transition was basically an act of capitulation. Vis-a-vis -vis Pinochet, neoliberalism, protected democracy in the case of Chile, vis-a-vis -vis Francoism and the conservative alliance of Franco and the national and transnational interests in the case of Spain. I mean, in Spain, they drafted and passed a new constitution in 1978. Franco had died in 75. Full legitimacy. Ours, different from Spain, we amended the 1980 constitution 30 times. OK, it's a kind of new constitution. But you know, this revisionism that is taking place in Spain and in Chile with respect to two transitions that I consider to be successful. Of course, you can be critical and self-critical. Lots of things could have been happen, uh, done in different ways. No? But I have no doubt, uh, sorry for being provocative, but you know, this is ad academic life also, uh, that you know, we have to be, we learned our generations, we belong to a kind of same generation. We learned the hard way. When we were 34 years old, we were classmates in St. George's. It's a little bit older, but not that much. <laughs> 
When we, we in, in, you know, when we recovered democracy in 1990, <coughs> we were 34 years old. We are the same age. So 17 years of our lives were under the, the dictatorship. No? I was a human rights lawyer when I was 23 at the Vicariate of Solidarity with Cardinal Silva and that prophetic church of those times. So I don't want to be complacent, but I never thought, I never imagined, at least in the case of Chile, that we would have achieved all that has been accomplished in this, in this 30 years. So I plan to celebrate the victory of the no vote, which is October the 5th, by the way. <laughs> Well, we, we have um, a, a very successful, I think, case of re-democratization. And I emphasize the word re-democratization yeah. because there is always a specter of the democracy that existed before and its institutions. And among them, the most important are the political parties. And it's a great advantage to have a full spectrum of political parties in your past because these generate new leaderships that don't need to create a political party or make a space for themselves. So take the example again of Senator Aleman. He was 32 years old, right? How could he have played such an important role in this whole affair, in these negotiations, without the fact that he represented the continuity of the democratic right of the past? <coughs> That's what gave you the legitimacy to speak to all these partners and to compose this. So um, the route taken was indeed the no route, which has been very successful. And that no route, in many respects, is based on the fact that this is a case of re-democratization. <coughs> so at this point, we would like to turn this over to the audience so that you have questions. And I think and I did Tim promise the the panel uh, before <coughs> our conclusion um, Ignacio was quite insistent that they want just a moment to be prospective you know so so what are the challenges that face Chile today as we look forward uh, but but as they're thinking about that we have a, a couple of people so if I may we'll start Diego. with the and would you uh, just mention your name and a little bit uh, you know what your Okay. What you're up to? So I'm Diego Sanchez, I'm a um, visiting fellow here and come from Spain, which will drive one of the questions. Thank you, Diego. So, um, there's all kinds of reasons to be compl complacent and to celebrate, uh, but let me try to be a little provocative because actually the panel was very complacent despite what Matthew said. <laughs> <laughs> so, a comment and a question. The first is a more analytical comment. I thought it was very unfair again, despite Eugenio's comment about the being compassionate, about the role that radicals, and especially the radical left, played both in Chile but in transitions in general. Now we have a lot of work, based partly actually um, previously in, in the Kellogg, showing that actually having radical forces strengthens moderates and leaves moderates with uh, all kinds of excuses um, to present themselves as the right people. Um, so, so I, I, I really think that um, just minimizing and um, call Chavista the left, the radical left, which I think is actually interviewed and a chronic in the context of Chile, or um, simply not understanding how it actually played a very significant role in politics, uh, might be uh, minimizing their influence. And then the question is about um, what we do with transitions of this kind. So I, I talk in private with Ignacio, I totally agree that um, Questioning the success of, of this kind of transition is wrong, that doing revisionists is wrong, but I think as wrong is to not understanding that this kind of transition creates all kinds of unfinished business. Uh, and create unfinished business, which will be particularly noticeable for the generation that was born in 1990. Yes, you are right, Ignacio, they feel for your lives, but they have other lives to live. <laughs> and their other lives to live are driven by partly what the, game, the, the political game was. So then the question is, actually, could you reflect a little on what was the unfinished challenges and the unfinished business that comes directly from the transition 
and it still influences politics in Chile. And a fair, and fabulous question. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, it was too long, but no, 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 no. it was but it's a little bit of pieces. In fact, I might put another chair up here, Diego. <laughs> let, let's take a couple p questions, and then we'll we we won't let him off the hook, Diego. I promise. Would yeah, I think hear? my question is also a bit linked Would to you that. Would you introduce yourself? I'm Sofia. I'm actually from Chile as well. Ah, so yeah. yeah. And what are you doing here in Chile? I'm studying Master of Global Affairs. KBM, yeah. Sofia. Welcome. Uh, so I think this links a bit to Dio's question. And also, I think it's kind of a hanging topic that you have been mentioning. So Spain changed their constitution. And we have not yet changed it, even though we reform it. And there has been a process led by President Bachelet about having a new constitution that I think it's right now, like sitting, waiting for something to happen. And I would like to know your perspective on how relevant it is right now, 30 years after the plebiscite, to have a new constitution for Chile. Two great Thanks. questions. Can we take a third or? or uh, yeah, one third yes. question, and then we'll, we'll ask the panelists to respond, please. Thank you very much. My name is Anna. I am a graduate student in the PhD candidate. Um, thank you very much for, for these wonderful remarks. I was just wondering the following thing. Um, it looks like you have put so much you put so much thought into how to design both campaigns. Sorry. You put so much thought into how to design both campaigns and you really had in mind all of the constraints of the institutional framework of the different actors. I wonder how how were you able to control the people during such a turbulent, polarized situation? Because it looks like you were so conscious of all the concessions you were supposed to make. And you were so focused on fighting against fear. But how, how do you control the masses who are in the end, the people on the street, the people who go out to vote, how didn't it escalate just from the point of view of people who are not at the forefront of the negotiation table? Fabulous. Three, three great questions on our panels here. Who would like to begin? That first one said, that last one sounds like, like, like one that Eugenio Tironi would be especially. Let me begin with some, some comments so about the comments. Huh? Uh, um, <coughs> the, the, the radical left, the Communist Party, I think that paid much more, much more than the Socialist Party in uh, uh, in sacrifices because they tried to create a military group in the mid '80s, and they were almost all killed, uh, and they were young people uh, of the communist elite. Uh, and uh, so at the beginning, after the group, the Socialists and the Communist Party were, uh, were, were repressed in this more or less the same, but afterwards, in the late 70s and 80s, the Communists got the worst part. Uh, and uh, I, yes, and I, I, we can say that the radicalizations uh, helped the moderates by something to say like Stalin helped, uh, I will say Putin. Huh? Uh, 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 <laughs> but in fact, uh, there is not continuity between the protesters that were, uh, we say, uh, developed by, by, by everybody and uh, where the communists put a lot of faith in the protesters and the plebiscite. There was not continuity. Because of what happened in 1986, that uh, Nacho remembered. Huh? So, uh, uh, for me, it's difficult to say, in political terms, uh, in intellectual terms, that the, that uh, uh, the radical left helped the results of the plebiscite. In, in, in uh, if you ask me moral. For that reason, I use the word compassion. Uh, uh, in moral terms, yes, but not in political and intellectual terms. Uh, um, and uh, what you asked about how we control people, well, we didn't control, huh? but uh, here was very important the franja. This, because 
something, I think that the, 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 the great, the thing that the regime, Pinochet didn't uh, imagine was the effect of having 15 minutes each night yeah. in, uh, uh, yeah. of free television. Yeah. First time in 50 years. First time 15 in years. It was, an, it was an impact incredible, uh, psychologically. Yeah, yeah. For the people. None of us missed it, ever. Uh, we uh, all uh, ran uh, to see it. And, and so the people <laughs> uh, saw this. That was the minute we, we hoped that we were going to win. When we saw the people that was uh, watching the, the Franca. And they filled themselves re reassured. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they really <laughs> uh, they obeyed uh, what the Franca was saying. Uh, as uh, divine uh, words. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, see, I, say, I, I think the Franca was very, very important. And the, and the political institutions, the political parties, as you said, have said somewhere, the political parties were organized, they have militants, uh, middle leaders in, in the field, uh, and the church. The church was another very important institution in this. Uh, very important. Andres? Yeah, I have two or three <coughs> comments. Maybe we're a little bit triumphalistas in the sense of uh, Thinking, I mean, we are so proud of what we have achieved these 30 years that maybe it's important just to to put to look what is the the, the, the I mean the, what's the, what's the way to, to say it in English el vaso lleno el vaso vacío yeah the glass, glass, the glass half glass half, half full glass, half, full, half, half, half empty and no. half full yeah yeah I, I would say that in in the in the sense of uh, the part empty of the glass. Uh, Chile has been growing very steadily, as Ignacio said, uh, since the last 30 years. If we will be able to grow at, let's say, a 5 or 6 percent rate for the following 10 years, we will catch up uh, Portugal. So Chile is really in the, in the chance of becoming, let's say, the first Latin American country really uh, able to surpass the threshold of, of uh, development. But we have still a debt very important in terms of inequality. Chile is still a very inequal, inequal uh, society. The Gini indicator at the, at the end of the dictatorship was uh, 0 0.47, 57, and now it is, is something like 0 0.50. So, for instance, in terms of the OECD countries, Chile with Mexico are by far more unequal than the countries that have rich development. So we have there a big, big issue to, to address. The new constitution, I have many doubts in terms of the new constitution because simply today, for instance, in the public opinion, the idea of a new constitution simply does not appear. It's much more, and I'm not, I'm not saying it's not important, I'm not saying we don't need to have a new constitution or a very important reform for the constitution, but what I'm trying to say is that today the issue is not as issue, an issue, as simple as that. Yeah. And whenever you move to, to go deep in terms of the, what a new constitution needs Chile, then we to start sailing in very difficult waters. Mm. Because what the, and I, am, I, am, I really support that idea, what I really think is that Chile, what it needs is moving from a presidential political regime to a semi-presidential political regime or a political presidential regime with some features of a parliamentary system. Mm. And that, of course, is a very disputed issue in, in the Chilean discussion. Um, that. Thank you. Ignacio? Well, three very good questions and, and trying to add to what has been said. Uh, Diego, first, two, two points with you, to, to your question, because you have two points there. One, you say the role of the radical left and the question of transitions. No? And you give the example, for example, of Chavismo. Well, in my op opinion, Chavismo and the radical left of Venezuela was not the example about moving towards transition, but rather of moving towards authoritarianism. So the 20 years that have elapsed or transcurred since 1998, <coughs> Hugo Chavez was elected democratically in 1998. It's been 20 years. What do we have today? Anything but a transition to democracy. We have a dictatorship, an authoritarian regime. So that kind of chavismo, that kind of understanding of a populist, plebiscitary kind of democracy 
uh, it's not a good example, in my opinion, of a radical left that is aimed at democratizing or redemocratizing or moving towards a transition to democracy. And the question, of course, of the unfinished business, which is very important in terms of, you say, of the new generations. We have a couple of Chilean people of the, of the new generation. So we may be complacent, allow us to be in what we have achieved in the last 30 years, starting from the <laughs> plebiscite and the struggles against the dictatorship. But we are not complacent about the state of the art today in many of the issues that here have been mentioned. For example, inequality. You cannot be complacent about the level of inequalities, not only income, but gender, territory, a very highly centralized country, environment, environment needless to say. You know, so the, the Finnish business is a long list. The question of inclusion and diversity, for example, gender issues, you know, which are so important. Uh, the voice of the social movements, which have had a very interesting uh, impact in the political system. Huh? The student movements, now, now the women's movement, now the environmental issues. So this issue about the second transition you know, toward development, an integral development which is not only income per capita or per capita income, no thing, I think it's the, 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 the big and finished business. You know? How to move not only towards democracy, and we are still halfway uh, in the direction of a full democracy, whatever one can understand of a full democracy, which never exists as such, but also development in these ideas of inequality, inclusion, gender issues, environment, indigenous peoples, which is a very, very important pending issue. We are about to reach some kind of interesting agreement there. Uh, th this, I'm in the opposition to this government, but I must admit that there's a, a big effort being made in that direction. Briefly, uh, Sophia, I do believe in the need of a new constitution. I wrote a book last year, which is called A New Constitution. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so at least it's an issue for Ignacio. With Genaro Arrega, with Genaro Arrega and Jorge Burgos. <laughs> Why? Why? Not because we would change overnight the complete text of the Constitution, but there is still a question about the origins of the 1980 Constitution, even though it has been 30 times amended. So, if you look at the bill presented by President. Bachelet in December, in, in March, without consult consulting the parties of parliamentarians of their coalition, if you look at the text, a very radical, supposedly new text, it's not very different from the current constitution. So when you go to the specifics, because the current constitution has been amended for 28 years, you see? So, well, but I think we knew, we, we, we need a new constitution in terms of having a constitution that is felt by the Chilean people as our constitution in terms of its legitimacy due to the fact of this illegitimacy of origins. No? So that's my view. We might have some difference there. But you know, I think we, we should move intelligently in some sort of way out of that. And finally, how did we manage to, to control the people? Well, we never attempted to control the people, <laughs> first of all. On the contrary, we attempted to channel the demands of the people, to exercise leadership, no? uh, coming out of the aspirations and dreams and demands of the people. And I think that in that terms, we were quite successful because the coming together of 17 political parties, to, even if it's to say no to Pinochet, no? and especially this profound merge of Christian democracy and democratic socialism after the Allende years, popular unity years, in which were in different trench systems you know, against each other, it has been a, a major accomplishment. So, you know, one of the things about this, I mean, I finish with this, we registered in four months, March, April, May, June, in four months, 1988, we registered 92% of the potential electorate, 7.4 million people. And only after that, late June, 88, the Communist Party came with a public statement that said, let's go to vote no. <laughs> because the Communist Party had called to not register and to not go to, not go to, the, to the plebiscite. So the, you know, the, the, the facts were there. The people registered. No? Uh, and you know, that's an exercise of leadership rather than controlling the people. No? Excellent. 
<clears throat> I do want to take just a minute to thank our partners and friends at the Inter-American Dialogue. This has been streamed uh, live to their, uh, uh, their considerable constituents and, and partners, so I want to thank them. I want to thank our panelists and, and Sam uh, for uh, a stimulating conversation. We have a, a, a wonderful opportunity to continue to converse, uh, have a conversation with these great uh, Chilean leaders um, in the Great Hall. Uh, so we, we, we may now begin to kind of recess and go into the Great Hall and enjoy a nice reception. And uh, please join me in thanking our great guests. Huh? Qué bueno. Mil gracias. Excellent, excellent. No, bueno, sí, claro. muy, muy bien los dos, los dos grandes líderes aquí. Oye, vamos.